At the blast of the horn, we declare, this is the day the Lord has made. Say this with me. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our victory together. You are our God and we will praise you. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds together. He has won a mighty victory by his power and holiness. The whole earth has seen the salvation of our God. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, he is risen, church. He is risen.
my everything. I say, Lord, you give you praise. Let me hear you sing it now. says there's none that can compare the lord jesus is the rock that i can run to when my heart is filled with fear he's the one the one who stands beside me yes you do each and I am so excited to tell you the story of how Jesus changed my life. I was raised in Ghana by my father and sister after my mom left the family when I was three months old. My father was a pastor and very busy, so my sister raised me. My childhood was traumatic and filled with abuse, which led to prostitution and homelessness on the streets in Africa. At the age of 20, I had a son named Daniel. We eventually moved to United States, but my life here was not much better. I found myself in another abusive relationship, and by 2023, I was pregnant with my second child. I was without a job, hopeless, homeless, and afraid for my life. The stress of running to protect myself and my children caused me to end up in 
the hospital, I was miserable and desperate for help. I was introduced to the Jonesboro Pregnancy Resources Center, where I met Pastor Richie and Melissa Howard on January 11, 2024. They didn't look at my appearance or my situation, but they accepted me as their own. That very day, I had decided that if God was real. He should save me from this disgrace, shame, anxiety, and abuse. If not, I will take my own life and that of my son and my unborn baby. But God revealed himself to me through the love and kindness of Pastor Richie and Melissa. They did not look at my appearance. They accepted me as their own and introduced me to Jesus Christ. Knowing the danger that I was in, they took me into their home and showed me the love of God. That was a shock to me because we were strangers to them. I had never experienced such a love before. We got to their home and they fed us and gave us a place to rest. That night, they brought me to the one-way service. As I entered the church, I saw and felt the grace of God. I said, God, you heard me and answered my prayers. Adum Erami. Since that day, my life has never been the same. Jesus has become my guiding light, my source of strength, and my constant companion. He has brought healing and restoration to areas of my life that was once broken. His love and grace have transformed me from the inside out. Today, I am internally grateful for the journey that led me to Jesus. I had my baby on February 27th with Pastor Richie and Melissa by my side in the hospital. I named my little girl Melissa. My name is Hannah Abbey and I'm 29 years old. I want to be baptized and join First Baptist Jonesboro because I am never going back to my old life. I will worship God for the rest of my life and tell everyone that I am redeemed a child of God in Shiran Kenyami. Well, good morning, church family. If you are a friend or a family member of Hannah, whether you're in this room or watching live stream from Ghana, Africa, I'd ask that you stand in her honor. Hannah, look at all these people standing for you. You've got Mom Melissa, little Melissa, and Daniel, and myself, and we're going to walk beside you. Hannah, I've got two questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on a cross for your sin, was buried in a tomb and raised from the dead. Yes. And have you, Hannah Abbey, repented of your sin and placed your faith alone in Christ Jesus? Yes. <laughs> Hannah, it is my honor and privilege to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ through baptism, raised to walk in newness of life.
is our God. Let's continue to worship. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. This is our God. that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never good, but Easter, there's something very special as we all focus our attention on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to read for you because the scriptures say that the resurrection is the reason why we can rejoice today. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they also have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
We were of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Can you just thank the Lord for what he's done for us? Why we can celebrate today? He is alive. And because he is alive, and because he has forgiven our sin, we can come into the presence of a holy God and talk with him. I mean, that's amazing. That's what prayer is. And so right now, we're going to take some time to pray that you may have some prayer requests that you want to ask him. You can come directly into his presence boldly and say, Lord, I've got a need. Can you come to me? Can you work in my life? Prayer is this extraordinary conversation with the Almighty. It's not like any conversation you will ever have. Because when you're talking to God, He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, He's ever-present, and He loves you. He wants to hear from you. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes, and I invite you, if you want to come to the front altar to pray, that you would come quickly, that you'd come and kneel before Him, maybe as a couple, maybe as a family or an individual, on this Resurrection Sunday. Listen. We have the privilege to talk with the Almighty. Heavenly Father, we gather today with hearts that are so full of joy. Lord, that doesn't mean that we don't have trials. It doesn't mean that we're not going through a very difficult time. It doesn't mean we're not in that dark valley of despair. But, Father, to have Jesus by our side, the resurrected Christ walking with us. We fear no evil because you are with us. And we pray, Father, that as we worship you today, as we continue in this attitude of worship, we acknowledge that you are here. You're not in a distant place beyond the clouds. You are right here among your people. You hear every word that we have sung. You hear every thought and intention of our heart. You know every detail of our life, and you still love us. In spite of our failures, you still love us. So we worship you. We thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ. And we pray as we continue in our worship today that your spirit would have a freedom to speak directly into our life. You know us. You know what's going on inside. Speak to us what we need to hear. That by the time we leave this place, we will know we have been in the presence of the living God. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to take your Bible right now, and I'm going to read the scripture that we'll be sharing in just a few moments. And, and in honor of God's word, I want you to stand with me. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 22. This is the passage that I'll be preaching on in a few moments. So hear the word of God from Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. This is after the resurrection. This is after the coming of the Spirit. And Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. And in verse 22, we drop into this moment, which says, Men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Let me now turn over to Acts chapter 4 and read for you verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, 
they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. You may be seated.
Some of you may have seen the movie called Cinderella Man. It's a movie based on a true story of a boxer named named James Braddock. Now, Braddock was a good boxer, but he was just kind of uninspired. He, he, He did well, but he lost his passion, he lost his drive, and so he just quit the sport. He went on just working and taking care of his family. But then the Great Depression hit. When the Great Depression hit, he lost his job. He did everything he could to try to earn some money, but he had no money. His wife and three kids were, were, were living in, in a cold house with very little food. And in a desperate place, he was talked into going back to boxing. And so he did. But this time, he, he came back inspired. He came back full of passion, full of focus. And this great comeback in, in the boxing arena he started to win. I mean, he was beating younger and better fighters. He famously fought Max Bayer. Uh, he was the champ. He was much larger, much bigger. He had, he had destroyed other boxers, which is why it was an incredible upset when Braddock actually won. I mean, it was an incredible story. And in the movie, one of the stunned reporters, one of these reporters who just couldn't believe what was going on, he came to Braddock and he asked him, what are you fighting for? And he answered this, milk. I'm fighting for milk for my children. You see, it wasn't about sport anymore. It was life and death. It wasn't just a game he was playing. He was inspired to do whatever it took to take care of his beautiful children and his wife. It's amazing what brings courage out of a man that had previously not been there before. What is it that motivates your life? What is it that inspires you toward greatness? That driving force that causes you to do 
what you need to do and have courage in the face of fear all around you. Well, we're in a sermon series right now. We have been for the last six or seven weeks. It's called Falling Forward, Growing in Christ's Likeness. And this, this study is looking at the Apostle Peter. And we're looking at how God took a, a, an old fisherman named Peter and turned him into a mighty man of God, a pillar of the early church. And we all can relate to Peter, can't we? I mean, there's something about him that just seems so very human, which means he is so flawed. He is so imperfect. And so we have been looking at the many blunders and failures in his life. And we're looking at how God used his failures to teach him, to grow him into Christ's likeness. And as we've seen, he really did believe in Jesus. He just didn't know him very well. He really did choose to follow Jesus with his whole heart, but he didn't really know where he was going. He really did love Jesus, and yet he had so many blunders and failures along the way in following him. And like Peter, our initial faith in Jesus may be very genuine, but it is based upon a limited view of who he is. His ways are not our ways. And to follow Jesus, we're going to be a little bit out of sorts. We've never lived this way before. And so we stumble along the way trying to follow Jesus with all of our heart. And oh, how we have so much to learn. Well, this morning's message on this Easter Sunday is entitled, Learning to Live, based upon Acts 2, verse 22, which we read earlier in our service. You see, the life of Peter has been a lesson in humility, hasn't it? Oh, the many blunders of Peter. So far in the series, we've seen Peter trying to keep Jesus from going to the cross and fulfilling the Father's will. We've seen Jesus, uh, Peter interrupt a conversation that Jesus was having with Moses and Elijah as they're planning the salvation of the entire world. We saw Peter get distracted on the sea and falling in the water. We saw Peter refuse Jesus and his attempts to serve him. We even saw Jesus or Peter draw a sword and cut off the ear of a man. And last Sunday, we saw Peter make this bold declaration of his loyalty and then straight away deny even knowing Jesus three times. You see, this seems to be the story of Peter. Time and time again, so many failures. But not today. Today, Peter gets it right. Peter loved Jesus throughout his life, but it just seemed like nothing in Jesus' life made sense to what Peter thought ought to happen until the resurrection. Well, when we think about the resurrection, we see that the death and the resurrection of Jesus puts the life of Jesus in, in this perfect perspective. His ways are higher than our ways. See, Peter had been confused about so many things. Everything that Jesus did, it didn't seem to be going like Peter had envisioned in his mind. The kingdom was different than he thought. It's not earthly, it's eternal. The Messiah was different than he thought. He wasn't just a great man. It was God in the flesh. The salvation of the world completely caught him off guard. It was not freedom from the Roman Empire, but freedom from sin and an eternal hell. The resurrection put everything in Jesus' life in perspective. And now that Jesus is alive, Peter had to learn to live in the light of resurrection. Well, the first thing I want you to see is that new life brings new courage. Acts chapter 2, we find Peter preaching in front of a mixed crowd of thousands. And he's not preaching in a beautiful sanctuary like this today. No, he is preaching in an, with his open air proclamation in the streets of Jerusalem. What got into Peter? What happened to him? Last week we saw Peter denying even knowing Jesus, 
And that was before Jesus was tried, sentenced, and crucified. But by this time, now Jesus has been beaten, whipped, and nailed to a cross. Are we talking about the same Peter? No. This is Peter after the resurrection. He's no longer the same man. He has met the risen Lord. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit. And post-resurrection Peter is filled with courage. Verse 22, he, he, he cries out, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. Now, now let, me, let me interpret what's going on here. Basically what's happening is there's a massive crowd that's in the city. And he goes out in the streets and Peter starts to declare with a loud voice, can I get everybody's attention? Everybody listen up, all eyes on me. Hey, listen, I've got something to say. Jesus. Now listen, it wasn't long ago that he denied knowing Jesus. And now in front of Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, in front of men who had influence to have him killed for insurrection, in a city where Roman soldiers were on the lookout for followers of King Jesus, Peter declares to everybody who would listen, I want to talk to you about this Jesus. Verse 22, this Jesus, a man attested by God, this Jesus who did miracles for all to see. You yourselves know who I'm talking about. And of course, everybody did know because Jesus was just publicly crucified. We go on to verse 23. This Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Now notice what Peter just did. He basically is saying, God was in total control, but you are guilty of his blood. Lawless hands have put to death the Son of God. You see, Peter may have denied the Lord on the night of his arrest, but Peter just took his stand with Jesus. Peter just openly before the city took his stand and identified his life with his Lord Jesus Christ. You see, an encounter with the risen Lord will produce visible changes in those who believe. When you meet him, you cannot be the same. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, people will know where you stand. Because if you're going to walk with Jesus, you're walking against the prevailing currents of the world around us. Repentance is a word that means a change of direction. And the resurrection radically changed the direction of the disciples. You see, before the resurrection, the disciples are timid, afraid. They're depressed. They're overwhelmed with life. But after the resurrection... They became aggressive, bold, full of joy. I mean, in their minds are thinking, Jesus just conquered death. What have I got to fear? And they began to live their life with passion and boldness, and they were so full of joy deep inside their life. They were so convinced of the resurrection. They would ultimately give their lives to tell the story, Jesus lives. See, new life brings new courage. But second, new life brings new purpose. New purpose. Peter came to know the most important thing in his life was Jesus. And knowing Jesus and making him known became the priority of his life. So here he is. On the day of Pentecost, thousands of people who've gathered in the city of, of Jerusalem and yet he stands boldly and courageously to share the gospel of how people can be saved. Verse 24, he says, This Jesus whom God raised up, 
having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. I love it. Peter is saying, you killed Jesus, but God raised him to new life. You were on the wrong team. You were fighting a losing battle. It is impossible for death to hold him in the grave. Jesus is the giver and sustainer of life, and there's no way that evil men could thwart the plans of a holy God. And God the Father let them put his son to death. This was part of God's eternal plan. Why? You see, the Father allowed Jesus to die for the sins of the world so that he could become the Savior of the world. This was God's will. This was God's answer for sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he allowed Jesus to die that he might conquer death once and for all. The cross was God's fulfilled promise. Verse 24, it's not possible that Jesus should be held by death. You see, nothing can thwart the plans of God. And aren't you glad? Because he's got plans for your life. He has a purpose for your life. When God speaks, it's as good as done. You see, nobody can thwart the plans of God for you. And so Peter is an eyewitness to the power of God that conquered death. I mean, after Peter saw Jesus crucified and buried, he then saw Jesus alive. Peter talked with him. Peter walked with him. Peter ate with him. Peter embraced him. Peter gave his life For him, Peter saw the risen Lord and was forever changed. Listen, Christianity is unique among all religions of the world. For Jesus and Jesus alone has been raised from the dead. He alone has conquered death. He he alone has paid the price for your sin and my sin. And when we say that Jesus was resurrected, we mean that he never died again. We mean that he is alive today. We mean that he was given a new and glorious body that will never suffer decay. And this is his promise to us. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever believes in me shall never die. In other words, his victory over death becomes our victory over death. You see, in a troubled world, believers must live with courageous faith, confident expectation. Eternity is already taken care of. Jesus has already won the battle. Your resurrection It is already secure. So don't be intimidated by a godless society that ridicules your faith. Who cares what they say? Don't remain quiet when the enemy tries to twist the truth. Don't back down when the secular tries to destroy what is sacred. Because Jesus lives. We too will live with him forever. Listen, new life. It brings new courage. It brings a new purpose. And third, it brings new hope. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. When I talk about perish, I'm not just talking about dying. I'm talking about an eternal death. I'm talking about a perishing in a place that that is so undescribable that to be totally separated from God for all eternity, 
It, it was, to, the word perish, I, I understand how awful it is that it caused Jesus to leave heaven, come to earth, so that we would not have to perish. You see, that is his promise for us. Because of Jesus, we now have the hope of eternal life in heaven with God. And when I say we, I mean Christians. Those who believe in Jesus and follow him as Lord. Those who believe in him and follow him as Lord of their life. See, the resurrection of Jesus becomes our reality through belief. Jesus said, whoever believes. And when Jesus says you must believe, he's not talking about mental assent, that you acknowledge that he lived, died, and rose again. It's not a mental assent that you believe such things. He means that you must now align your life to what you say you believe. If you truly believe, you'll adjust your life to what you just said that you believe. In other words, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you must worship him. If you believe that he died for your sin, then you must repent of your sin. If you believe that he conquered death, then you must live for him. If you believe that he's Lord over all, then you must live as Lord of your life and serve him as Lord. If you believe that he's coming again, well, you had better get yourself ready for that day to receive him. True belief will bring true change in our life. And the evidence that we believe is not primarily about us, but what Jesus does in us. His presence changes us. The living Lord, his presence changes us. His love transforms us. His spirit empowers us. And this new life in Christ is available to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes in Jesus and follows him as Lord, this promises for you everlasting life. Now, if you look around this room today, we've got a lot of people. We've got a full balcony. We got this, it, we're, just, we're, we're packed with people. And as you look around today, you'll notice that we are all so very different. You are unique. You are one of a kind. Your skin, your hair, your height, your look. God made you just as you are. And whatever God makes is good. We are a very diverse people in this room, aren't we? But we have this in common. We are all alive today, and we will all die someday. All of us have a temporary body. All of us are going to have to deal with sickness and disease. Every last one of us someday will be laid into a grave. A thought that brings two different reactions. It'll bring fear to those who do not know God. And it brings joy to those who love and obey God. Why the difference? Well, though we all die, we do not all have the same destiny in eternity. Now, you see, when, when we walk on this earth, it seems like we are defined by different labels that people put upon us. There's so many labels that we, that we all carry. It's just how the world is. But we, 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 are, we are labored by our gender, male and female, and only male and female. We're identified by our skin color. We're identified by, by, by our skin, red, yellow, black, and white, and all kind of shades of brown. We're identified by body type, small, medium, large, extra large and mucho grande. We're all different sizes. <laughs> We're identified by our financial status, rich or poor, or, or, that, or those who are poor but live like they're rich. 
political identifications, Democrat, Republican, Independent, and this new party called, I don't believe any of you guys up there in Washington, D.C. That's, that's the biggest group that's growing. <laughs> Ethnicity, nationality, personality. We're identified by so many labels, so many different categories. But when we die, there are two categories, saved and lost. Which one are you? Which category would you fall in if you died today? Well, if you just hesitated, I would be concerned. If the evidence is not clear, I would be concerned. If your coworkers don't know, I would be concerned. You see, it was clear to all who observed Peter's life, something happened to Peter. Who is this guy preaching about Jesus to a crowd of thousands? Who is this guy calling out the very ones who had Jesus put to death? Who is this common fisherman speaking with such authority? Well, Acts 4.13 is the key. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, when they saw this radical life change in Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled at their life. And then they realized that they had been with Jesus. Is there any evidence that you have been with Jesus? Is there any evidence that the living Lord is resident in your life and it's changed you from within and it's expressed in everything that you do? Could people observe and see that man, that woman has been with Jesus? The scripture says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, the power that sets us free from sin, the power that changes us deep within, the power that, to give us courage in a hostile world. Listen, hope, hope for the believer is not wishful thinking, but confident expectation at every promise of God will be fulfilled. And that hope brings confidence in eternity. We no longer have to fear death. We have confidence in its eternity. And confidence in eternity brings great joy while we live this life on earth. I want you to understand this morning that the grave is the great divide. And in that moment that we will all face one day, your relationship with Jesus is all that matters. For in a place built for the dead, the tomb where Jesus was laid, Jesus was raised from the dead. And all who believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to bow your heads for a moment. I want you to close your eyes. This morning, this Easter Sunday morning, we celebrate, we rejoice, we are overwhelmed at the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We're all alive. and One day we will all die. According to Jesus, those who believe in him will not ultimately die, but have everlasting life. What about you? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because it is in Christ Jesus alone that my hope is found. He is the only one who's conquered the grave. He is the only one who offers forgiveness of sin. He is the only one by way, we can find our way to the, heaven, the Holy Father and eternity with him. Do you know him? Are you following him? Is there any evidence that you have met the living Lord? 
Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak deeply into our hearts to reveal where we are. Father, you know where we are. Show us. Father, I pray if there are any in this room today who don't have confidence, confident expectation that they will see you in heaven for eternity. Father, may they settle that today. May they come and respond to this free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. May they believe in him, align their life with him, and experience fullness of life in him. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In these next few moments, let me tell you what's going to happen. Our choir and orchestra is going to come back on stage, and before the, the service is over, they're going to send us out big. They're going to send us out strong, so stay to the end. But before that happens, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you have heard today. So we have an invitation song, and we'll be led by our worship team. And as we do, we'll have some pastors here at the front and up in the balcony. We'll have some prayer partners on either, either side. And if you want to come to Jesus, you want to give your life to him, I want to encourage you to come and take him by the hand and just say, I, I don't, I, something within me is saying, this is what I need to do. I don't fully understand it, but I know that I want Jesus in my life. And they'll talk with you and they'll share with you. Maybe you're here today and you realize, man, I've, I've been doing this on my own. I need a church family. I need a place where or I can be a part and grow and serve and, and follow him with my whole heart. And you want to come and join with us, I encourage you to come and just talk to one of our pastors here. And they'll, they'll walk with you and they'll help you understand what those next steps are. Or maybe you just want to come and kneel and pray. There's something about just responding to God and kneeling before him and say, God, I've heard you today. I'm getting serious. I'm getting back in the ring. I've got something to live for, and I want to serve you the rest of my life. Or maybe there's somebody in your life you know is not saved. You've got a burden for them, and you're just overwhelmed that if something happened to them, that, that you, don't, you don't have a confidence they would spend eternity with you in heaven. Listen, come and just pray for them. This Easter Sunday, this is our hope, and it's found in Christ alone. So would you stand together? Let's stand and, and sing, and our, our pastors and prayer partners will get in their place. You respond. You come as we sing. Simple song, sing it here often. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light by strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand There in the ground his body lay the light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ because of that no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. There's no power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from.
from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand last to clear that one more time in christ alone in christ alone my hope is
He is risen. <laughs>